Okay, we should be live. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we are live. How is everyone doing out there? Can you guys? Phone, Alexander, can you guys yes, see us? Just... Can you guys hear us? If you can, let us know. And we have some people on the live chat already waiting. Excellent. Here. Let us know in the live chat if you see us and if you can hear us okay. Hello from Helsinki. All right. Hello from Finland. Yes, Holland. High five. All right. Durham, UK. Maine, center of the universe. Hello from Maine. Mm -hmm. All right. London says hi. And isn't that a coincidence? Because we have in London, the Oracle mm -hmm. of London, Mr. Alexander mm -hmm. Mercurius. Alexander, how are you doing? Well, I'm very well, but a little a little tired. I spent much of the day uh, ploughing through the Mueller report, which I've read in full. I've also read Barr's uh, comments, um, which he made at his press conference. And I've also watched a very interesting video in which Rudy Giuliani, who is one of Tr Donald Trump's lawyers, uh, comments on the Mueller report. So I've been quite busy and I've had to absorb a lot of material. But I think the picture's pretty clear. All right. Someone said the sound was a little low. I, I amped it up a little for both of us. We hope everyone is doing really, really good out there, really well out there. Mm. Here it is evening. It is 10 at night. In London, I believe it is 8 o'clock. Correct. And in, the US, in the U.S., it was uh, mid-afternoon, early afternoon, when A.G. Barr gave a press conference. And after that press conference, Alexander, he delivered the two-year in-waiting Mueller report to Congress, mm. and eventually he put it online. You grabbed it right away. You had a, you had a good uh, reading session, 400 pages mm. in a couple of hours, a good speed reading session. Mm. Mm. Alexander, what do you make of the Mueller report? In summary, Alex, a gigantic fishing expedition which caught no fish. It's divided into two parts. The first is a uh, exhaustive investigation of the collusion allegations, which involves uh, taking every single contact between the Trump campaign and the Russians, taking them incredibly seriously, investigating all kinds of people, putting them through the grinder, in effect, to try to get them to admit to something bad, and absolutely nothing bad ever turns up. It is uh, uh, relentlessly hostile, I should say, in its tone and content to Donald Trump and his campaign, but in the end it comes up with nothing. And the second part is another section which is relentlessly hostile to Donald Trump, and which, in my opinion, by the way, has no factual or, or, or evidential basis, it seems to me, to go completely against the remit of the report, which is this huge exploration of whether Donald Trump committed obstruction of justice. I, I don't understand why that's even in the report at all, actually, because that was not what Mueller was supposed to be investigating. After all, there is no evidence that Mueller's investigation was ever obstructed as a matter of fact. And most of this part of the uh, report is a uh, gigantic and uh, very academic and, in my opinion, entirely misconceived academic discussion, much of it on very obscure points of law, which in the end comes to no real conclusion. Now, can I say about that, um, um, Giuliani made a point in this interview about how uh, uh, Mueller is treating Trump to an entirely different state uh, 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 um, standard of proof. Give, give so, our viewers uh, some some uh, some backstory. Yeah, yeah. Giuliani was on Fox on Fox News. Yeah, he was on Fox right News. After the report and, and uh, exactly. A good, a, a good interview and a very long one, put through some very very acute questions. But the the particular point he makes, and it's an entirely valid one is that this report does not presume Donald Trump's innocence. It presumes his guilt. Um, it, that is where, at its starting point. So it does not set out to uh, exonerate Trump 
it sets out to prove him guilty. On the question of collusion, it cannot do so because the facts are simply not there. On the question of obstruction, it doesn't, uh, it's not able to do so either. As I said, it hides behind this academic discussion. A person is not supposed to prove their innocence. It is for the uh, uh, investigator to try to prove guilt. So this report has the entire standard of proof the wrong way round. And I have to say, especially with the obstruction, but to a great extent also with the collusion, reading it made me very uncomfortable. How did we go from collusion to obstruction, Alexander? I mean, we know why Barr, um, excuse me, we know why Mueller kind of leaves the obstruction a little yeah. open-ended, even though Barr slams the door on it and says there is no obstruction. But yes. Mueller, and, and, Mueller intentionally leaves it a little open. Yes. And, and, and I'm sure all our viewers understand why. But how did Absolutely. we go from collusion to, to obstruction? Right. To obstruction. To obstruction. I, I say it's very straightforward. I mean, uh, what happened uh, uh, is that very, very quickly they find that there is no that there is no collusion. I mean, uh, uh, Andrew McCarthy on National Review, and he's a former federal prosecutor, has said that Trump, uh, sorry, that Mueller must have known that there was no collusion and no conspiracy with the Russians by uh, uh, a mid two thousand seventeen or perhaps late 2017, at the latest. So in order to keep this investigation alive, he goes for obstruction. And of course, he doesn't get there. He, he doesn't come close, in my opinion, to making out a case. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but um, I, I think that the problem they had, the, the, the people who were drafting the report, who, as I say, are extremely hostile to Donald Trump, is that they didn't want to clear him. They didn't want to say, at the end of the day, we found no evidence of any crime, because that would have been what they would have had to say if the investigation had been confined to collusion. So they construct this incredibly fantastical and, as I said, academic and, in my opinion, profoundly flawed academic argument around obstruction, I, I, which, as I said, was not part of the original remit in the, in the investigation anyway. And you said that Barr cleared uh, Trump. He did. But what people don't always forget is that so did Rosenstein. And Rosenstein was the person who appointed Mueller and who, of course, supervised him. I have to say, it speaks very badly of, Rosen of Rosenstein that he allowed this thing to get so completely out of control and, and uh, 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 for Mueller and his team to go down this particular obstruction rabbit hole because that's all it is. But great optics to have Rosenstein standing in back of Barr during that press yes. conference. I thought that those were brilliant optics to have him there. The guy that kicked off this entire two-year hoax, you can yes. see he was sitting in the back, you know, right behind Barr kind of saying, you know, oh, crap. You know, <laughs> this whole thing is over. And you could tell on his face he was just, he was a defeated man. And, and yes. BJ in the comments says, how do you obstruct something that isn't there? Well, let's let's just deal with that obstruction because, of course, you're absolutely our, our, our commenter is absolutely right. The fundamental problem: there are many fundamental problems with the obstruction allegation. Firstly, there is no underlying crime. As I said, Donald Trump at, was at all times an innocent man and knew it. He knew he was innocent. So, what was his motive? to obstruct a legitimate investigation. None. If there was a legitimate investigation, it could only clear him, and he would have known that. That is the first thing. The second thing is that, of course, a lot of this so-called obstruction is things that he was actually lawfully entitled to do. So he is lawfully entitled to sack Comey, he would have been lawfully entitled to sack Mueller, by the way, had he done so. He sacked Comey and the investigation went on unimpeded. He didn't sack Mueller. And in fact, on the contrary, as Giuliani has explained and has been reported in the media, in fact, 
his administration gave every possible help to Mueller and his investigative team. I mean, they never invoked executive privilege, which they could have done. They never, in fact, at any point in time, asked uh, uh, that, it, that information be withheld or redacted because it was classified. Mueller got everything. So there is no, there is no actual obstruction. What there is, is sometimes, uh, quite often actually, Donald Trump sounding off, getting extremely angry about an investigation that is causing him extreme embarrassment and is affecting his ability to govern the United States and to conduct his foreign policy and seems intended to call into question the legitimacy of his election. So he sounds off. He talks to various people about doing various things, like sacking Mueller, for, ex for instance, or getting uh, uh, Jeff Sessions to un unrecuse himself. But in the end, he always draws back when he encounters advice, and none of these ha things happen. He never does anything. So uh, it, 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 it's absurd. If I can just give an example, people are bring, bringing up Richard Nixon and Watergate. In Richard Nixon's case, when he was basically caught for obstruction, there was an underlying crime, which was the burglary of the Watergate building, which was carried out by people who were connected to and acting for Richard Nixon's campaign, his presidential election campaign. And Richard Nixon did actually take actual steps to stop that investigation into that crime. He authorized payments to the burglars, you know, of harsh money, and he tried to get the CIA to obstruct the FBI in its conduct of the investigation. Did it very badly, by the way, and he, he didn't succeed, as we all know. But that's what he did. This, there's nothing like that here. I mean, Donald Trump never did anything even remotely like that. There's no underlying crime, and there's no actual action. So where's the obstruction? It all revolves, as I said, on attempts to read Donald Trump's mind in connection with things Donald Trump never actually did. So let's jump on what I think the, the Democrats and, and the mainstream media stenographers, the corrupt mm. mainstream media, are going to seize upon. And I think they're going to jump on, on the part of the report where it says when Trump first found out that the special counsel and Mueller were going to start investigating this this collusion hoax, yeah. and Trump kind of panics and says, my presidency is done, and, and all this stuff, which to me, I mean, no matter who you are, it actually sounds like a very, you know, real response, a very logical response Absolutely. when you're about to be investigated for something, you know, you're going to sit there and say, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh crap. You know, this is a disaster yeah, until you, you get legal counsel, until you talk to other people, and you start to put, you know, some things together. But I think they're going to seize on this. What, what, what do you make of that? Well, I think you've answered it. I mean, it's an emotional response by someone who had previously been told that he was not under investigation. I mean, the whole lead up to, Co to, Comey's, invest to Comey's sacking is that Donald Trump wanted Comey to confirm publicly what he was telling Trump privately you are not under investigation. And Comey consistently, and for entirely phony reasons, was refusing to do that. So he was allowing this cloud to hang over Donald Trump and his presidency. And entirely understandably, Donald Trump became incre incredibly angry about this. And then Rosenstein comes along and provides this memo in which he says that Comey completely mucked up the Hillary Clinton uh, uh, email investigation, which he did. So Donald Trump then decides, well, you know, I'm going to sack this man. And at that point, at that point, when he does something which is fully within his lawful power, getting rid of someone who has gone out of his way to conceal the fact from the American people that the president is not under investigation, Somebody comes along and tells him, well, now you are under investigation. Well, wouldn't you, faced with that sort of thing, you know, get really angry and very upset? Donald Trump is an emotional man. Of course he is. 
he's entitled to have his emotions. It's not what he says to his intimates, it's what he does. Exactly. And he didn't do anything. And I mean, yeah, to try and build something out of this is nonsense. All right, let's do a super chat and then we're going to get into Russia and WikiLeaks, Alexander, because I think that's also yeah. a very interesting part. Yes. A super chat yes. from Jass. At his press conference, Barr went out of his way to commend Rosenstein. Does this mean that he believes that Rosenstein did not try to wear a wire? And he's referring to the to the part where Rosenstein and a lot of the FBI DOJ guys were kind of sitting around saying, you know, let's I'll, I'll wear a wire and I'll get Trump to to say this and that. What do you make of Barr commending Rosenstein uh, before the press right. conference? Just just right. PR. Right. Yeah, was it right? Okay, just, just just on the question of the wire, I don't think that there is any contention that Rosenstein said he would do that. I mean, he didn't actually do it, but he did say he would do it. He says it was a joke. joke yeah. Others, others like Andrew McCabe, who was the deputy director of the FBI, said that he meant it entirely seriously. I think Barr uh, was being extremely clever because there have been attempts to uh, uh, say that Barr is in some way distorting Mueller's findings and to attack uh, Barr and to make out that Barr is Trump's placeman. So by bringing in Rosenstein, who is no friend of Donald Trump's, and getting, Donald, uh, getting Rosenstein to associate himself with uh, Barr's le uh, uh, findings and legal conclusions, it takes away the heat from Barr himself and ultimately, let's be frank about this, from the president. So I think it was an extremely astute move. Keep your enemies and close. Keep your enemies close, exactly. And I think that's what Barr was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Let's get into what I think is perhaps one of the most interesting parts of the Mueller mm -hmm. report, which is the, the Russian part and the WikiLeaks part. So we see that Barr and Mueller, Barr in his statement and Mueller in the report, mm -hmm. they tie in the Russian, the St. Petersburg uh, troll farm mm -hmm. up there. They tie them mm -hmm. in. And they tie in the GRU uh, hacking. Mm. And they manage to circle it all back around to WikiLeaks. Get into that, mm. Alexander. Take but, your time. Explain this because I think this is really important. And I say this yeah. for you to take your time and explain this because I think the mainstream media is going to butcher this. They are going to get this 100% wrong. They're going to demonize Russia again. They're going to demonize Assange. They're going to demonize WikiLeaks. And I think today... As to what's happening with Assange, we need to be careful to present the facts mm. and, and, yes. and to refute all the demonization that they're going to throw at Assange's way. Yes. Well, first of all, I think we should... First, can I just start with the, what I think is the nonsense story, which is the troll farm in St. Petersburg? I mean, I come back to what I've said before about the, that particular troll farm. Uh, 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 Muller, in his report, basically repeats all the, the old, stale stories about the vast influence of this troll farm. He doesn't say, he doesn't say that Putin ordered the troll farm to do that. He doesn't say that the troll farm is part of Russian intelligence. It's all apparently owned by this man, this businessman, this rich Russian businessman, Prigozhin, who is supposed to have these connections to Vladimir Putin, which are never proved or explained. And there's this supposed great influence on the presidential election, which is never proved either. So I, I, I am going to put that thing to one side because I think that's absolute nonsense, actually. And I think anybody who really looks at this, this that side of it, it is nonsense. The much more interesting part of the story is, of course, the hacking, the, the alleged hacking of the DNC. And there's a few things that immediately stood out for me. Firstly, if we go back to Mueller's famous indictment of the GRU military officers who he says carried out the hacking. He gives their names. In this report, he doesn't. <laughs> in, he, in that indictment, he doesn't provide any evidence to support the indictment. In the report, he doesn't, do any, he doesn't provide any evidence either. All that part of the report is redacted. 
all the part that is supposed to consist of the evidence is redacted, presumably because it's classified. If it is classified, it cannot be produced in a court of law. And as it cannot be produced in a court of law, it's very difficult to see how these 12 men could ever be prosecuted, even if they were ever arrested, which, of course, they won't be. So this whole thing is declamatory. It, it, it's, it's an assertion. We mustn't treat assertions as facts. People do, of course, but that is all we have here. Now, a, a, a few other things about this. Um, these GRU officers, there's no suggestion about who ordered them to do what uh, Mueller alleges that they did. It's always been said that Vladimir Putin uh, ordered the GRU to go off and hack the DNC computers. There is nothing of that in this report. Nothing. There was a report in the Washington Post back in 2017, August 2017, where there was a claim that uh, um, 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 intelligence had found evidence, had, had, that they'd obtained evidence that, you know, Vladimir Putin himself had given these instructions. If, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing of that kind in this report, just as, by the way, there wasn't in the indictment. And um, if we go beyond the fact that, as I said, this, this, claim of Russian hacking as we've not been given the evidence of this and in the report we're not being given the evidence of the reporters you have to read what is said about the interactions or alleged interactions between the GRU if it was the GRU and WikiLeaks very carefully. Because first of all, it, most of the interactions, the interactions did not happen, or the alleged interactions, did not happen between WikiLeaks and the GRU directly. That's not what Mueller says. What Mueller says is that the interactions were between two uh, uh, entities, Guccifer 2 and DC Leaks, which got in yes, which got in touch with WikiLeaks. Now, Mueller claims, and again, this, we're not shown any evidence for this, that Guccifer II and DC Leaks were Russian intelligence fronts. But very importantly, he produces no evidence and doesn't actually assert that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange personally had any knowledge that these two entities were, in fact, anything to do with Russian intelligence. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that they were. I don't know. But even if they were, assuming that they were, there's no evidence in this report that uh, uh, um, Julian Assange and uh, WikiLeaks knew that they had any, uh, that they were dealing with Russian intelligence. The next point to make is that it's not actually definitely confirmed that WikiLeaks did get the emails, the DNC emails, and the exactly. Podesta emails from Guccifer 2 and uh, uh, DC Leaks. It's it, it sort of, it's very cleverly insinuated, both in the report and in the um, indictment. But it doesn't, they're not actually able to prove that. The, they give some... Uh, um, they make some deductions which might be said to point in that direction. But again, deductions are not proof. And very interestingly, indeed, the report says something which the indictment did not say, which is that uh, Muller admits that there is actually a chance, a possibility that WikiLeaks obtained emails, DNC emails, some of the published emails from a leaker, not from Guccifer II. He leaves the door open. Uh, Mueller leaves the door leaves, open. He, he leaves that door open. And in fact, he, he actually names the WikiLeaks employee who might have acted as the courier. So um, it's, it's a story which uh, Mueller is trying to make very impressive 
And if you read it uh, quickly, it looks impressive. If you drill behind it, it doesn't look very impressive at all. It doesn't really correspond with some of these theories that have been, you know, floating around out there. Um, the, the, the dots are not fully joined up by any means. And as you correctly say, it leaves the door open for other possibilities. Just for completeness, I would say that Muller is very, very clear. One thing he's very clear about is that whoever the leaker was, if there was a leaker, it wasn't Seth Rich. Now, again, I, I'm not saying whether or not that's true or whether it's not true. Again, I don't know. But Muller he says does that in the report. Out. He, he, he yeah, absolutely. He, he says that in the report. He mentioned, he mentioned, he mentioned Seth Rich. He, what he basically says that's is... That's very interesting. What he yeah, what he basically says is that uh, uh, um, Assange uh, misled people by making them think that Seth Rich was the leaker, which is in a way a way of denying that Seth Rich was the leaker. So, uh, I mean, perhaps it's not a complete cast iron denial, but I think we've got to treat it as that. But it leaves open the possibility that there was a leaker. So... Uh, that, I can assure you, is not something the media is going to report extensively. But that's what the report says. And if Mueller really did want to find out who the who the leaker was or how the WikiLeaks got those emails, all he had to do was go to London and to the Ecuador embassy and interview Assange, true? Well, indeed. Well, indeed. Assange now, is that's today very... the only person that really does know. Well, indeed. And, and perhaps a few other people in WikiLeaks. In WikiLeaks certainly yeah. Assange. Exactly. But of course, he's never done that. In fact, I, that's a very good point, because I, I'd like to touch on a few things. Firstly, um, it, I, I should say that it's quite clear from this report that uh, Mueller's team and the FBI have had access to Assange's computer. <laughs> now, uh, this is... Uh, who, who, gave uh, the, the who, who gave well, them access? Well, it must have. It, it must. It must have been the Ecuadorian authorities. Now, um, I, I should say that the that the this the paragraph which reveals this is very heavily redacted, probably to conceal the fact that the Ecuadorians did this. But it's clear that they have had access to it to Assange's computer. That's one thing. The second thing I wanted to say is that, of course. Um, we is, must that, is, that say, is that stated, Alexander, in, in the report that they yeah, have access? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, it doesn't, again, speak about this directly. What it says is that, you know, uh, and Assange's computer shows. Okay. You know, words like that. Words like that. So they've obviously had access in some form to Assange's computer. The, 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 the next thing I was going to say is, of course, um, there's not actually been any real investigation of the DNC leaks at all. And there hasn't been any real investigation of that whole uh, uh, um, theory, because, of course, it's not just the fact that um, Mueller didn't interview Assange and didn't interview WikiLeaks, even though he's interviewed all sorts of people, including, by the way, people in Russia, which are, you know, I get to come to shortly. But he doesn't interview WikiLeaks and Assange, he doesn't really talk about the CrowdStrike report. And of course, we know for a fact that there was no independent FBI investigation. They didn't look at the DNC service. Even Andrew McCarthy, who is an, a former federal prosecutor who believes that there was a Russian hack of the DNC computers and that Assange was a knowing accomplice of the Russians in all of this, has pointed out that there was no proper investigation. So we, uh, Mueller doesn't come to any explanation here of how he reaches these conclusions. He, he doesn't really provide any explanation or any real evidence to back, let's not call them conclusions, but these allegations of this of, of, of this connect of these connections between WikiLeaks, between the Russians, about the hack, about any of these things, he states them in in ways that, as I said, make it seem as this whole thing falls together 
but, but the glue isn't there. <laughs> it's done on purpose, of course, because... Oh, of course it is. Yeah, Mueller knows that, that, that the media is going to try to fill in the dots with, with more outrageous stuff. Well, of course it is. I mean, I, 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 my own personal view about this is that what Mueller is trying to do, Mueller personally is trying to do, is he's trying to project the FBI. So he, he is trying to, because, of course, he was the FBI director for many, many years, and I think he sees it as his personal... Um, uh, uh, fiefdom and he wants to do everything he can to protect it. So I think that's his motivation. And so he skates over the fact that none of this has ever been properly investigated. And at the same time, uh, many of his investigators, and let's be very clear of them, some of them are, oh, in fact, some of them, most of them are Democrats. And as Julie, Giuliani pointed out, one of them was uh, chief counsel for the Clinton Foundation, which is extraordinary, exactly, which is extraordinary, actually. I mean, they, of course, have a massive interest in perpetuating this story of the Russian hack, of the DNC, of the Russians conspiring with WikiLeaks and publishing the emails. I mean, that is the theory that Hillary Clinton and the Democrats have run with, and these investigators, these Democratic Party investigators, are not going to do anything to undermine them. Okay, so we touched upon WikiLeaks and Assange as, as being a key piece to this puzzle. The yes. other key piece to this puzzle, of course, is Christopher Steele. Mm -hmm. Very is interesting he, that is, you mentioned... Is he mentioned in the report? Because I know your answer to this. Is he mentioned in the report? Did Mueller speak to him and we just don't know about it? Because I can't think of a more central person to this entire Trump witch hunt than Christopher Steele and the Steele dossier. I think it's marvelous that you answer, ask me this question, uh, Alex, because I so well remember reading back in 2017 how Christopher, Christopher Steele's dossier was providing the frame narrative for the entire collusion invest investigation. We know that uh, uh, Comey attached it to the um, intelligence community assessment that was shown to Trump. We know it was published by BuzzFeed. We know that it was used to play, obtain Pfizer warrants against Carter Page. We know it was circulated to the media. We know, we know definitely that it played a central role in the investigation. McCain, it Brennan, is, Clapper, all these guys. Clapper, and if we go back to what I was talking about, about how uh, um, the evidence that was provided in August 2016 to Obama about how it was Vladimir Putin who gave the orders to carry out the hack. Well, that, that also, it's now, I think, absolutely clear. That came from the collusion, uh, from the uh, Trump dossier, from the Steele dossier. Well, it's a, it, it, it will amaze our, our, our viewers when I tell them it is not in Mueller's report at all. <laughs> 400 is, pages, and he doesn't mention Steele at all. <laughs> 422 pages. I think Steele gets one mention. Um, the dossier is mentioned in connection with the uh, uh, showing to Donald Trump of the intelligence community assessment in January 2017. But you would never know of the importance of this dossier to the whole Russiagate conspiracy theory or, or the enormous influence that it had or the enormous effect it had on the conduct of the investigation, or the way it was used by Adam Schiff and the Democrats in the House Intelligence Committee, or any of that from this report. It's as if this thing never existed. It's, it's, it's disappeared like a puff of smoke. I mean, he doesn't even, dis he doesn't discuss it to say, for example, that it's unverified. He doesn't go even, even into that sort of territory. I mean, it is bizarre. If you want to talk about, you know, the missing, the missing link in this, <laughs> the, the, the steel dog. It's, it's, it's not it's, like he's, he's, a, he's it's, in it's, London. It's, Go it's, grab the guy. You can extradite well, it, Assange from the it, UK, but you can't extradite steel. Well, of course you can. And in fact, can I just add something? I mean, uh, um, um, to answer an earlier question, no evidence that steel has ever been questioned. 
it's 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 stunning. It, I mean, it's it, it it just shows what a hoax this whole thing was. You mentioned disappear, well, Alexander. You mentioned disappear. There's another person that that's disappeared, oh. who Giuliani yeah. mentions maybe maybe the person that actually kicked off this entire setup of the Trump campaign, and that's the Maltese professor, Professor Mifsud. I mean, this whole thing is like a it's like a yeah. Hollywood movie. A Maltese professor Mifsud. Papadopoulos, yeah. a Halper in London, the entire yeah, well, setup, uh, the Australian, uh, I'm, I'm, I believe an Australian ambassador who, who was part they, of the mix. I mean, Downer, Mr. Downer. Yeah, Mr. I mean, Downer. this is the other very, the very interesting thing because you, 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 you've identified this very interesting cast of characters. By the way, uh, Muller talks about all sorts of it, all sorts of people, most of them inconsequential. Mr. Halper is not in the report. I couldn't find his name. <laughs> uh, 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 Downer, I think, is not mentioned by name. He is referred to as a foreign diplomatic source or something like that. Uh, uh, Miss, yeah, no, exactly. Mifsud is there. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about Mifsud is that, of course, in the indictment of Papadopoulos, it's again insinuated Mifsud is, in fact, um, um, something has some kind of connection to the Russians and um, is involved with the Russians in some way. Well, this report goes into Mifsud in a little bit more detail than the indictment did. And I have to say again, that that doesn't look at all convincing based on what I read about Mifsud in this report. Yes, he's been, he traveled to Russia a couple of times. He knew a few people in Russia of some importance. He knew lots of other people also. I mean, he was apparently connected with the Clinton Foundation, but, this idea that Mifsud is some sort of giant Russian SVR, FSB, GRU agent <laughs> operating out of London, uh, uh, I mean, it finds absolutely no substantiation in this report whatsoever. And, of course, uh, um, uh, Giuliani, in this interview, uh, um, floats the theory, which he says he believes, is that the whole Papadopoulos affair was a setup, and that Mifsud was in fact some kind of agent provocateur. FBI, CIA. F CIA. I mean, Halper was. Halper was uh, CIA, was he not? Indeed. 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 Uh, Julian is very careful not to say who he who was pulling the strings. He, he says he doesn't know, and I think we got we got to uh, 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 rest with that. But I mean, he, he's fairly clear that he thinks that uh, um, Mifsud was deliberately leading Papadopoulos on and leading Papadopoulos into a trap. Now, I have to say something about this because, of course, the only thing that Papadopoulos does which is at all interesting, is his inter interconnections with Mifsud. I mean, he does have some connect, he does have some contacts arranged by Mifsud with some people in Russia who are part of the Valdai group, but nobody of any real significance, I should say. And he does uh, talk about them and report them to the Trump campaign. But these, connect these contacts with the Russians and it's not clear, and Mueller admits it's not clear, how far Papadopoulos was authorized by the Trump campaign to engage with, engage in them. These contacts were completely open, entirely above board, and they led nowhere. So where is Mifsud then? Where well, good is question. this guy? I, I get to make- And, I and Papadopoulos, and, and, and before you make that assumption, Papadopoulos was, from the Mueller report, I gather, was was being investigated more for his contacts with Israel yeah, than Russia. Exactly. He's not really a exactly. Russian expert, not a Russian expert at all, actually. Well, indeed. Well, indeed. Well, indeed. I'm going to make a, I'm going to say something about this, which I don't think anybody else has said. And I want to stress this is a theory. It's an opinion. It's a possibility. It is not a fact. I'm starting to wonder whether Joseph Mifsud is even a real person. I, 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 his academic background seems to be extremely sketchy. I mean, he certainly did, did have connections with certain universities in Italy and uh, in Scotland, in Stirling University. And he seems to have run this London Diplomatic Academy, which seems to have had no real existence. 
and he seems to have travelled a bit. But he doesn't really seem to have very much of a life story behind him. And I wonder, I wonder whether what we're looking at is uh, obviously an individual uh, um, operating under some kind of assumed identity. Now, I, I, I want to stress this is a theory. I have no facts to support it. But if, if that is correct, then that might explain why Professor Mifsud has so completely disappeared vanished. so that we are uh, vanished into thin air so that we're asked to believe that the mighty U.S. intelligence community, the biggest and most powerful intelligence community that has ever existed in the history of humankind, cannot find him, which I find incredible. Now, of course, the other possibility is that he's, you know, uh, um, you know, a uh, uh, dead and under concrete or in a fish tank somewhere chopped up. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. But as I said, I, I am starting to wonder about Professor Mifsud. And if he was indeed, as Giuliani thinks, and as the, the, the facts suggest, some sort of provocateur, then of course, the fact that you know this might be a constructed identity, you know, you know, spies do use constructed identities. That that seems to be me to become a more plausible theory. But that's all I can say about it. And a lot of the spying was going on in the UK, the MI6, and there's a lot of people Absolutely. in the in the live chat that are saying the connection between the Scripple case. And what's happening with uh, with the Mueller investigation? Or what happened with the Mueller investigation? There was a connection between the Scripples as well, Sergei Scripples specifically. Well, it, well indeed. I mean, I mean this, uh, this whole uh, thing uh, is is astonishing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. I, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I mean, again, you know, here the dots haven't been joined up at all. The the, the connection is that the, the man, I believe his name is Pablo Miller who has been alleged to have been Skripal's controller, is supposed to have, I think it's supposed, I mean, I think it is acknowledged that Pablo Miller worked in Orbis, which is Christopher Steele's firm. And of course, Christopher Steele was the person who produced the Steele dossier. And I, I, I've seen suggestions floating around that Skripal himself may have had a hand in the trunk. In, this, in the creation of the steel dossier. I, I, I want to stress, I've heard these things. They're perfectly, I mean, I'm perfectly willing to believe them. Coincidence? Something like that. Well, I, I, I don't, I, what I'm going to say is this, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> coincidences can sometimes happen. They can also pile up in suspicious ways. I don't want to go beyond in this uh, uh, um, program, what I actually know. I mean, I floated a theory, and I again stress, it's a theory about Joseph Mifsud. Um, you know, I, I, I'm perfectly happy to float a theory about Skripal, but I want to make it clear that there are, again, certain facts that might point in that direction. At this moment in time, it's only a theory. We don't have proof. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, shift gears. Alexander, what is Trump's next move, if any? I think Richie Forky asked that question a little while back. What's Trump's move, if any? And what is the Democrats' move? Are they going right, to go for impeachment? Do, do they have right, a, okay. an opening for impeachment? <laughs> right, OK. First of all, let's what, say what Trump's move should be. I think he should now put every pressure and suppression that he can on the Justice Department, which has been so resistant to him up to this point, to carry out a proper, full and thorough investigation of the events that led up to this gigantic hoax, this ridiculous conspiracy theory, which has hobbled his presidency. I mean, we've talked, we've talked about the questions about Joseph Mifsud that certainly exist in my mind. We've talked about the questions that exist about the DNC hacks and what actually happened there. We've talked about, uh, well, we haven't talked about Giuliani's frank disbelief, which I share that Papadopoulos was the cause right. of the Trump investigation. I mean, uh, because this is, this is the official Get into story. That. Get into that. Yes, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean the, the, the idea is that, uh, um, uh, um, that uh, Papadopoulos 
turning up in a drunk in a bar in London. By the way, I know I know that particular bar, <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, and turning up, meeting, meeting, uh, meeting. It turns out it's actually a meeting. It was not quite the accidental encounter that we were initially led to believe, but meeting down at this uh, at this bar and blurting out stories about how he'd heard from the Russians about the fact that they had dirt on Hillary Clinton, that this supposedly started this gigantic investigation. I've never believed that. That has been the official line that the FBI has uh, hidden behind and the intelligence community has hidden behind. I don't believe that. And we still don't know for a fact about what got the um, um, Russia Gate investigation going. Um, we don't know the actual truth about this. We don't even know, in fact, the exact date that the investigation began. Um, we know that on the 31st of July 2016, Peter Strzok signed a document, which we've never seen, by the way, which had some connection to do with Papadopoulos. And some people have treated that document as the starting point of the investigation. But I don't believe that. Giuliani doesn't believe that. I don't think anybody who looks at this thing with any real seriousness believes it. I mean, lots of things, far too many things were going on before, before that event for that to be conceivably true. So, you know, I, 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 think, I think that Trump really should push hard for a proper impartial investigation by someone not connected to the FBI directly, by someone not connected to the intelligence community. In my opinion, a retired judge is the right person with a team made up of lawyers uh, um, to sift through all this information and finally get to the truth of how this whole thing began and of the appalling way in which it was conducted. You're not, you're going to find in this report all sorts of things about Carter Page, for example, and his famous trip to Moscow and how that didn't really amount to anything. But again, you know, in, in the usual, shall I say, snarky way that this report does, it ends by saying, you know, that not all the facts about Carter Page's trip to Moscow in August 2016 are completely clear. What, what, what isn't clear? I mean, I don't know what isn't clear. I mean, Alexander, he went, they were he gave, saying stuff like he had shares in, in Gazprom or Rosneft. Yeah, I Gazprom, forgot which. Rosneft. Yeah, Rosneft. Worth well, five, six billion. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, it mentioned somewhere, it mentioned somewhere that he had a, a meeting with someone from Rosneft. But I mean, you know, this is nonsense. I mean, it, it has no value. It has no evidential value. It shouldn't be in the report. They shouldn't be making these sorts of comments. But, you know, uh, 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 you will never find anywhere in the report any discussion of the FISA warrants on Carter Page, on the fact that he was being uh, surveyed, and the fact that these FISA warrants were based in large part, in fact, I suspect, 19, you know, in, in, in larger part, on the Steele dossier, which, as I said, barely gets a mention anyway. Well, Trump can release uh, those uh, documents, can't he? Well, of course he can, and I think, I think he must. I think he should. I think we, need, we now need to see the other side of the story. I mean, this is a very, very aggressive inquisitorial document. And I think in his own political interests, Donald Trump needs to release the other documents in order to start putting the record straight. And I think we need a proper investigation to find out the truth. I'm going to just say before we get into all of this, the other aspect of this invest of this of this um, collusion investigation is that every conceivable contact between anybody even remotely associated with Donald Trump or the Trump campaign um, is uh, and, and anybody from Russia, even people who I happen to know are, are not friends of Vladimir Putin and are not closely connected to the Russian government, um, is investigated exhaustively. I mean, there's an enormous amount of discussion about a meeting, for example, between uh, Kirill Dmitriev, who is the head of Russia's sovereign wealth fund, 
or rather uh, investment funds. Uh, uh, and uh, the man who heads Blackwater, uh, Prince, Prince, I can't yeah, remember. Prince, his, yeah. Yeah. Eric Prince, exactly. And this meeting in the Seychelles. And, you know, I was reading and I said, you know, what does all this mean? You know, wh wh where's this all going? It doesn't go anywhere. And yet there's this constant attempt to try and make it sound as if or these, there's something there's something sinister or suspicious about these Russians contexts. everywhere. Russians everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing like that at all. As I said, there's constant attempts to make out that, you know, Paul Manafort's dealings with various Ukrainian oligarchs. Get, get into is, that. Get into that. A lot of people yeah, no, in, the, I, in the chat I, are talking about Ukraine. The real collusion is Ukraine well, indeed, and I, the lie about well, Manafort in Russia where it's really Manafort in Ukraine. Well, indeed, well, indeed. I mean, this is it. I mean, you know, Paul Manafort clearly had lots of connections with Ukrainian oligarchs. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, for me, one of the leading characters that, uh, that, that, that turns up with whom he was in contact in 2016 and before is a very, very powerful Ukrainian oligarch called Renat Akhmetov. Renat Akhmetov is consistently portrayed in this report as um, pro-Russian. Uh, Akhmetov is not pro-Russian. He supports Poroshenko, who is the president of Ukraine, the pro-Maidan president of Ukraine, in the current election campaign that is underway in Ukraine at the moment. Now, Mueller does not look at the Ukrainian side of things supporting Hillary Clinton. That's only coming up now. Giuliani, by the way, touches on it in this uh, video with Fox News. But what he does is he treats these contacts that Manafort has with these Ukrainian oligarchs as somehow um, implying collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, or possible questions about collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. And he always refers to these oligarchs, some of whom, as I said, are not, in fact, pro-Russian, as pro-Russian oligarchs. And there's a huge amount said about a man called Kalimnik, who is, as I said, Ukrainian, though he also has Russian citizenship, but he's Ukrainian. And again, it's all made out to be somehow very sinister. And it isn't. I mean, it, it, it might be wrong in many ways, but it is not wrong in proving collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians. It, 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 it is not what Mueller tries to make it seem to be. And we have this happen all the time. There's, there's, there's another case of uh, a meeting between a, a Russian banker called Piotr, Piotr Avon, who, um, by the way, is well known to be uh, by no means a supporter of Vladimir Putin and uh, various people in the Trump campaign. And he comes along, uh, uh, not to, I think, the Trump campaign, the Trump transition team. And Avon is basically lobbying to prevent his bank being sanctioned. And he tells uh, Mueller that, in fact, uh, that he spoke about this to Putin. And Putin was very sceptical and told Avon, well, you know, you're free to lobby, but I don't think you'll achieve anything. So Avon, who is, as I said, not a friend of Putin, and as Putin pouring cold water over the story, comes to the Trump campaign, tr to the Trump transition team, tries to lobby, achieves nothing. And Mueller turns around and again makes this into some sort of outreach between the Trump campaign, Trump transition team and the Russians. You get this all the time as I say, innocuous contacts that lead nowhere, achieve nothing and are always made out to be somehow sinister and, and, and connect to something. It's red which meat, they though, don't. isn't it? Isn't it, Alexander? It's, it's just it's Mueller funny. feeding red that, meat to the Democrats, it, it, to the mainstream media, that, to the that, deep state. Well, that's exactly what it is. And the most spectacular example of this, of all, is, of course, the meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and the Russian lawyer, Natalie Veselnitskaya, in, in Trump Tower. And again, we see all sorts of attempts to try and make this out into something very, you know, sinister, that this was an attempt by the Russians to outreach 
to the Trump campaign, uh, uh, Mueller has to admit that actually nothing came out of this meeting. And Giuliani, again in this video, says, expresses his belief, and he gives very compelling grounds for it, that this meeting also was a setup uh, orchestrated by Glenn Simpson and Fusion GPS to uh, basically set up Donald Trump Jr. and the Trump campaign. And he may be right. Well, she met, with, she met with Glenn Simpson before the meeting and after the meeting, I believe, uh, one day she, apart. Indeed, indeed. Well, she met him before, uh, the day before, the day after, and then on the same day. So I mean, she has three meetings about <laughs> with Glenn It's not a setup, though. It's not a setup. <laughs> well, apparently not. So, so there we go. But I mean, you know, th this is this is again. I mean, it's and well, I mean, there the was there was a, there's a whole section here which I thought was possibly, I mean, a very strange report, the most bizarre, in which um, Mueller apparently, in all seriousness, tries to construct a case that this meeting between Veselnitskaya and Donald Trump Jr violates campaign financing laws because this dirt that Veselnitskaya was supposed to, supposed to give uh, a Donald Trump Jr. was uh, a thing of value <laughs> that supposedly should have been declared and wasn't. Well, even Mueller has to accept that that is just too ridiculous to take seriously, and he drops it. But I mean, you know, there's a whole section. I mean, I, you know, they, I, I have to say there are some very weird things in this report, but that that may have been the weirdest. So, so but I mean, they're... also, it yeah, shows how desperate. It just it also shows how relentlessly uh, Mueller is at, is trying to construct a case that that, that as I said, he nothing. goes down out of nothing. He goes down a rabbit hole uh, uh, exploring these bogus theories. And of course, in the end, even he has to admit it doesn't lead anywhere. Yeah, he, he proved that that he had a two year long conspiracy theory. And, and that's what he was doing. He was just investigating a conspiracy theory that turned out to be a complete hoax. Does yes, Mueller, though, give enough ammunition for the Democrats to move towards yeah. impeachment? Yes, this is this is I mean, this is the other big question, because, of course, first of all, you're quite right. I mean, he's investigating a conspiracy theory, which turns out to be a hoax. But of course, he never says that. He, he says no one committed any crimes. No one colluded with the Russians. He doesn't go out and say the, the, uh, the Steele dossier is a load of nonsense. And this uh, conspiracy theory is a conspiracy theory and is a hoax. As you correctly said, he's feeding red meat to the Democrats. I think the, red de the Democrats are going to try to run the, this thing, and they're going to try and use the obstruction allegations to try to put more pressure on Trump. I think if they do so, they will be acting extremely unwisely, because I personally believe that it is impossible to base impeachment proceedings on this report. I, I, I think it doesn't come close to satisfying that uh, requirement. I mean, even Mueller can't ultimately say that uh, Trump obstructed justice. He'd love to, but he doesn't. And of course, he has to admit that there was no collusion either. So what is there in the end to base on? I think we're going to see a lot of noise from the Democrats. I think they're going to go around saying that the uh, uh, report shows that there's lots of unanswered questions. I think they're going to try and run more investigations. Well, of course they are, which will end up with nothing. I think that we're going to get all sorts of uh, uh, horrible and insane headlines in the media. I think CNN and New York Times, and Washington Post MSNBC. and MSNBC, they're all going to spin this like mad. But in the end, we can't get away from the fact that there was no collusion, no evidence of collusion, and also that the obstruction uh, 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 allegation, as any good lawyer would say, to use uh, Giuliani's phrase, just doesn't fly.
Alexander, from what I understand the report and, and looking over it, it was very lightly redacted. It wasn't heavily redacted. So what did the Democrats very, gain very, by asking for for the unredacted, subpoenaing no, the unredacted nothing. version? Do they even gain anything out of that? Nothing. They gain absolutely nothing. The only thing they would gain is that they would undermine their own case. Because I strongly suspect that, the, I mean, the, the most heavily redacted part of it is the part that deals not with the collusion allegations, but with the alleged Russian interference, the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the St. Petersburg troll farm, and in fact, all the underlying evidence against the 12 indicted GRU officers. Now, given that that's the part that's redacted, if it was unredacted, we might see how uh, weak that evidence is. So, uh, I mean, the redactions are extremely light. And again, I think anybody who uh, uh, takes the trouble to read all 422 pages of this report, including, by the way, the appendices, which I have read, uh, and which, uh, I mean, uh, um, you know, the, you need a few stiff drinks to get through it, if I can put <laughs> it. You know, provided you do that, you will see that there's very, very, very little that's blanked out. Yeah, and they don't want those, the, the parts with Russia. They want those to stay redacted because exactly. if the truth exactly. gets out, people are going to just they're going to laugh at, the, at at how weak the exactly. entire Russia part of this hoax is. Exactly. The parts that are redacted, it's in their interests to, to keep, keep redacted. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it doesn't undermine their story. The redactions make their story look stronger. And it's a bipartisan support for that story. It's Republicans Absolutely. and Absolutely. Democrats Absolutely. that support Absolutely. that Russia story. Absolutely. I mean, the obstruction part of it is barely redacted at all. And that's where the, uh, most of the red meat is. And also all this all this nonsense about all these contacts between Russians and members of you know Trump's team and Trump's campaign. Uh, that's also uh, uh, um, um, barely redacted at all. Yeah. All right. Michael Riley, thank you for, you for your super chat, Tulsi 2020. And finally, Alexander. Loretta Lynch met with Bill Clinton on the tarmac. A lot of people forget about that meeting in Arizona. Do you think at the end of the day, we may never find out? You always hold out hope that we may find out. I don't think we ever will, but you always hold no. out hope that if this may point all roads pointing to Obama. At well, the we end must of the day, that's, that's where it all leads to. Well, we must hold on to hope because without hope, it all dies. Um, but if I may say so, you're not, you're not going to find anything about Loretta Lynch meeting Bill Clinton in Mueller's report. There's none of that there either. I mean, that, that's not what he talks about. I mean, that obviously, I mean, he would say it wasn't within his remit to look into those things, which is true. But I mean, uh, um, the other side of this, which is, you know, what was going on between the Justice Department, the unmasking, the reports that you know were being sent to Obama, all that side of it, that isn't there. I mean, you'll find all sorts of things about, you know, Michael Flynn's completely inconsequential activities with Ambassador Kislyak, for example, which, again, amount to nothing. You'll find lots of things about things that Michael Cohen has said. By the way, several of them, I should say, actually help Trump. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, they're, they're not by, by no means all of it Cohen's evidence in the end turned out to be uh, um, a damaging to Trump. Right. You'll find all about that, but you're never going to find anything about all the other things that were going on. As I said, steel bed features, crowd strike. I, I don't remember seeing crowd strike's name even mentioned. You're not going to let, hear, you're not going to find out about Glenn Simpson. Ukraine, you're not going to read it. Ukraine, Uranium One, Blue, Uranium one Bruce Orr, McCabe. Yeah. None, of, none of that is there. Uh, and uh, uh, James Comey's only role in Brennan, and Brennan isn't there. Uh, the only role, uh, as I said, James Comey has in it is, you know, to, in, in this prolonged discussion about whether Trump's sacking of him was obstruction of justice, which, of course, it, I mean, I, one other point I'd say about that, because uh, one thing that Mueller skates over is that when Comey was sacked, the Russiagate investigation wasn't even a criminal investigation. It was a counter-espionage investigation. No one he ever mentions that. that. 
No one ever. No, 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 you know, I, I don't. I mean, again, you know, may, maybe I missed it in my reading of it, but I didn't see it in Buller's report either. So you know, there we are. So I mean, it, it, you won't find any discussion about the illicit things that were going on in the Justice Department and the FBI and uh, the CIA and the DOJ and within the Obama administration. I mean, that just isn't that. Yeah. You know what this all is about, Alexander? It's, you know, look at this shiny object here because we don't want you to look over there at what's really going on. Well, that's right. That, that's well, what that's this right. is all about, yeah. Well, that's right. That's right. The only thing I would say about it is that the shiny object, if we're talking about the specific report, turns out in the end not to be that shiny, <laughs> because in the end, he just wasn't able to make his collusion case stick. He, he, it, 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 it was, as I come back to what I said at the beginning, a fishing expedition that in the end didn't catch any fish. And However hard he tries, and Mueller tries very hard, he can't get around that. Yeah. So would you close it out and consider this a big victory for Trump? I think it's a conclusive victory for Trump. I think, I, I think, I think, at least in legal terms. I mean, obviously the Trump, the the Democrats and the media are going to spin it how they want to. But I think uh, the reality is he's been cleared. He always said there was no collusion. He was right. Even Mueller admits yeah. that. <laughs> Barr was the difference. Sessions was was awful, and Barr made the difference. Would you also conclude that? Well, well, absolutely. And I have to say, this is another thing, which is, of course, that um, Mueller tries to uh, uh, um, uh, make Sessions into the good guy in response to all of Mueller's criticisms. Of, oh, sorry, all of Trump's criticisms of Sessions. That's not my opinion at all. I mean, the fact of the matter is Sessions, as head of the Justice Department, which he was, even though he'd recused himself, and Rosenstein, as Deputy Attorney General, allowed this fishing expedition to, 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 to go completely off the rails, uh, 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 causing enormous damage to the constitutional system of the United States and calling into, into question the legitimacy of a presidential election and calling into question the very office of the presidency. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think that if Barr hadn't stepped in when he did, um, I think what we would have got much closer to the 2020 election is a report which would still have said there was no collusion because frankly, the collusion case isn't there but which I suspect was trying to find a way of saying that there was obstruction by Donald Trump and might have ended up saying it. But it, it wasn't going to get past Barr. And so they didn't, they didn't go there. Do you think Barr handled at the end of the day, you think Barr handled this whole process the right way? Absolutely. I, 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 think, I think Bill Barr is the hero of this affair. I think, I think he, he enforced the law. I can't put it more simply than that, and that's more plainly than that. That is how we will yeah. end it. We've got an hour, hour, eight minutes. Thank you, everybody who joined us on this live stream. Thank you very much for all your questions. And uh, let's see, Alexander, let's also say to everybody to subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. So subscribe, click that notifications bell, smash that like button, share the Duran with everybody you know. And while you're at it, pick up a shirt, duranshop.com. Follow us on Instagram as well, the Duran underscore com. And what else do we have? And uh, yeah, donate to us on PayPal and Patreon as well. The uh, links are in the description box. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for that super chat, Michael Riley, last minute super chat. So right, Alex, bread and circuses. Yeah, bread and circuses, clown world, honk, honk. <laughs> Upside down, left is right, right is wrong. Upside, <laughs> upside down, right is wrong. Guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Gu guilty that's, until you prove yourself innocent. <laughs> exactly. That, that's, that, that, that's where we've reached now, it seems. Russia, Russia, Russia. Russia's everywhere. And uh, yeah. blame everything yeah. on Putin and Assange. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate it. 
And we'll have some videos coming out tomorrow as well. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, Alexander, the Oracle of London. Any last words, Alexander, before we uh, sign off? Uh, um, um, thanks to our viewers for sitting patiently through an hour and eight minutes uh, uh, as we sort of dissect this piece of nonsense, because that's what it all, all, all ultimately was. Well, I, I mean, a, 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 job. A, 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 a gigantic investigation, which should never have been launched into the in the first place in a crime which never existed. I mean, and of which no evidence, for which no evidence of it ever existed. But there we are. Well, thank you, Alexander, for getting that, uh, the Mueller report, getting it downloaded, getting it read so quickly. That's some speed reading right there and uh, giving us a good analysis of it. I'm sure everyone appreciates it. Alexander Mercurius in London. Alexander, have a good night. I know I'm going to go to bed as well. Everybody else, have a great day wherever you are in the world. Take care.